A very good evening aspirants welcome to the Hindu newspaper analysis brought to you by Shankar IAS Academy for the date 21st of November 2022 displayed here are the list of news articles that we have chosen for today's discussion and in addition to the news article discussion don't forget to listen to the preliminary practice question discussion which is followed after the news article discussion also we are providing with mains practice question which will be really helpful for your mains preparation okay Now without wasting much time let's get into the first news article discussion See have a look at this news article the news is that the opposition parties in the state of Maharashtra had criticized the governor of the state the opposition parties are claiming that the governor had made insulting remarks against Chhatrapati Shivaji so citing this they are demanding for immediate removal of the governor from his post This is the crux of the news article given here and in this context let us learn about Chhatrapati Shivaji and about his administration okay see Chhatrapati Shivaji was born in Pune in the year 1627 and the credit for establishing such a huge Maratha kingdom goes to Shivaji and his father see in the year 1637 he received the revenue and administration rights of Pune from his father and later emerged as one of the greatest rulers of the Maratha empire so this is a brief about chhatrapati shivaji now we will focus more on shivaji's administration because this is important for your prelims see first let's see about the central administration see shivaji appointed eight ministers who are known as ashtapratan each minister was personally accountable to the emperor and note that they were not appointed on a hereditary basis and also the posts were not permanent see the ministers were held in the post till the pleasure of the king and they were regularly transferred okay also note that no jagir was endowed to any civil or military officer instead they were paid directly from the treasury and know that the term jagar generally means the power to collect revenue and the power to administer the government okay now see this table here i had listed out the names of the ashtapratan and their respective roles pause the video and go through it and this is about the central administration now moving on to see about shivaji's military administration see shivaji's army organization was very remarkable he gave cash salaries to ordinary soldiers and the chieftains of the army received revenue grants which is known as the sarangam and this is along with the cash then shivaji maintained a regular troop known as paga see it consisted of 30000 to 40000 cavalry that is the horse force and the infantry that is the foot soldiers okay and know that the troop were supervised by a head called havaldas Then in the medieval era Shivaji was the first Indian monarch to recognize the need for a naval force. He built dockyards and ships for both trade and defense purposes. Then to maintain fairness and stability of the military, you no, know, he appointed people from all castes. For example, Pindaris who are the tribals of neighboring villagers were also part of the Maratha army. Okay? then he also prepared his soldiers extensively in mountain combat techniques so this is all about his military administration now finally let's see about revenue administration of shivaji see shivaji introduced a new taxation system called chauth and under this tax system one fourth of the land revenue was collected as a tax from the neighboring mughal territories see it was a kind of military subsidy that was collected for safeguarding the mughal territories from external attacks shivaji also introduced another taxation system called as sardeshmukhi see under this system 10% of supplementary tax was collected and this is collected to maintain the hereditary right of the king on tax collection processes then under the shivaji's rule the local cultivators were asked to pay 40% of their produce as land revenue then shivaji also established the rayatwari agricultural system under this system the state maintained direct communication with the rayats or farmers regarding taxation process see this reduced the corruption done by the middlemen so this is all you have to know about the revenue administration 
So we had seen in this discussion about the central administration, military administration and revenue administration of Chhatrapati Shivaji. Not only for prelims, these points can be utilized in mains also. Okay. And with these key points in mind, now let's move on to the next news article discussion. Have a look at this news article. See, recently a PIL petition has been filed by the relatives of Netaji Subhashchandra Bose. And this was before the Calcutta High Court. The petition says that Subhashchandra Bose was being distorted in films and in various forms of media. And the petition is seeking the court's direction to the center to take steps to stop such distorting activities. This is the crux of the news article given here. And in this backdrop, let us learn about Netaji Subhashchandra Bose and his role in Indian independence. Okay. See, Subhashchandra Bose was born on January 23, 1897 in Katak, Orisha. He was very patriotic and deeply influenced by Swami Vivekananda's teachings when he was a school student. Then, in 1919, Subhashchandra Bose went to England to compete for Indian civil services and he got selected in 1920. However, Subhashchandra Bose left the training midway and returned to India in 1921. This is because he was deeply disturbed by the Jallianwala Bagh massacre. On his return to India, he came under the influence of Mahatma Gandhi and joined the Indian National Congress. So, this is a brief about Subhashchandra Bose. Now, let us understand Subhashchandra Bose's role in Indian independence. In 1921, he started working under Deshbandhu Chittaranjan Das, whom he later acknowledged as his political guru. See, note these facts. This is all very much important for your prelims perspective. Okay. Then in 1928, when the Motilal Nehru Committee declared in favor of dominion status, Subhashchandra Bose along with Jarlal Nehru opposed it because both of them asserted that they would only be satisfied if complete independence is granted for India. Then in the year 1930, Subhashchandra Bose was jailed during the civil disobedience movement. See, he was released from jail in 1931 after the signing of the Gandhi Irwin Pact. After release, no, he protested against the Gandhi Irwin Pact and opposed the suspension of the civil disobedience movement. Then, Subhashchandra Bose was elected as the president of Haripura Congress session in 1938. During his term as Congress president, he set up a national planning committee. Okay. Then in the next presidential election to the Tripuri Congress session of 1939, Subhashchandra Bose was re-elected. In that election, he defeated Dr. Patabi Sitaramaya, who had been backed by Mahatma Gandhi and the Congress Working Committee. Okay. Then during the phases of World War II in 1939, Subhashchandra Bose brought a resolution. The resolution gave the British six months of time to hand over India to the Indians. He also said if the British failed to give India back, then there would be a revolt. And there was much opposition to his resolution. So he resigned from the presidential post and formed a progressive group known as the Forward Bloc. Then in January 1941, Subhashchandra Bose disappeared from India and reached Germany via Afghanistan. There, he sought cooperation of Germany and Japan against the British Empire. Then in the year 1942, he began his regular broadcast via radio from Berlin. This broadcast has aroused tremendous enthusiasm in India. And in July 1943, Subhashchandra Bose arrived in Singapore from Germany. And in Singapore, he took over the reins of the Indian independence movement in East Asia. He then organized the Asad Hind Fauj, which is also called the Indian National Army. The army consisted mainly of Indian prisoners of war and it proceeded the work towards India's liberation from British rule. Later in the year 1944, the INA, that is the Indian National Army, headquarters was shifted to Rangoon. Then in the same year, in March, the INA crossed the Burma border and stood on Indian soil against the British. However, the defeat of Japan and Germany in the Second World War forced the INA or the Indian National Army to retreat and the Indian National Army was not able to achieve its objective. See, Subhashchandra Bose was reportedly killed in an air crash over Taiwan on August 18, 1945. But it is widely believed that he did not die in an air crash and he lived for many years. 
and there is not much information to be found about him so that's all regarding this news article see through this news article we covered about an important and eminent freedom fighter netaji subhash chandra bose and note that you will be frequently asked such kind of questions in your prelims as well as in mains regarding him questions were asked so make note of each and every fact and utilize it in both your prelims as well as mains preparation so these key points in mind now let's move on to the next news article discussion now have a look at this front page article it talks about the newly agreed upon loss and damage fund the article reports that the announcement of the loss and damage fund was a highlight of the two week long cop 27 that is conference of parties 27 that saw little agreement among countries on other issues so this is the crux of the article given here and in this context let's learn about the newly created loss and damage fund the syllabus relevant to this discussion is highlighted here for your reference kindly go through it and now let's start a discussion firstly let us briefly see about the phrase loss and damage see in un climate talks the phrase loss and damage refers to cause already being incurred from climate fueled weather extreme events like you can say this rising sea level droughts etc so to put it more simply it refers to economic loss caused due to the climate change induced disasters okay and as the article says climate funding so far has focused mostly on cutting carbon dioxide emissions in an effort to curb global warming here one third of the climate funding till now has gone toward projects to help communities adapt to future impacts of the climate change the point here to note that climate financing or funding till now didn't pay for any damages caused due to climate change induced disaster to the vulnerable countries okay and this loss and damage funding would be different from climate financing because it specifically covers the cost of damage that countries cannot avoid or adapt to okay now here let me give you an example if you can recall there was a monstrous flood in pakistan a few months back this flood killed nearly 1500 persons and caused a huge economic loss to pakistan if this flood is found to be happened because of climate change loss and damage fund would come into action this fund will be used to help the affected country in getting over the damage caused by climate change induced disaster okay but note that there is no agreement yet over what should count as loss and damage caused by climate change see initial report suggested loss and damage fund could include damaged infrastructure and property as well as harder to value natural ecosystems and cultural assets the terms and conditions of the fund is to be decided by a special committee which will submit its report at the next year's cop 28 which is going to be held in uae that is united arab emirates okay see this loss and damage fund was opposed by developed nations particularly the us the rationale behind the opposition was that this lnd fund or the loss and damage fund would hold them legally liable for massive damages caused by climate change okay but finally due to constant pressure by the developing nations european union and the us accepted the decisions to create a loss and damage fund so this is all about the loss and damage fund mentioned in the news article now let's move on to see india's reaction over the creation of the loss and damage fund or this lnd fund see india on sunday described cop 27 held at egypt as historic for securing an agreement on establishing a fund to address the loss and damage caused due to climate change induced disasters the union minister for environment no who has represented india at the summit said that the world has waited far too long for this now coming to the important issue of who pays for this newly created fund see as i mentioned earlier the details about the fund are not known till now but the news is that developed countries will contribute to the fund and the vulnerable developing countries will be at the receiving end so this is all about this news article given here 
and through this you have known about the loss and damage fund that is to be created regarding this climate change induced disasters see as you know then and there in environment whatever is in news is what asked in your preliminary question so pay attention to this kind of topic and it is going to help you to address your mains oriented questions as well okay and regarding this fund and all know those points can be easily used to highlight your mains answer and with these key points in mind now let's move on to the next news article discussion have a look at this news article see today's lead editorial is written by mr c rangarajan as we all know mr c rangarajan served as the 19th governor of rbi and he also headed the 12th finance commission okay see this makes today's editorial quite important and in this editorial mr rangarajan writes about the steps that india must take to become a developed country by 2047 so that is on the 100th anniversary of our independence okay and while the main core of the editorial is about the steps that india must take to maintain high gdp growth rate for the next 3 decades mr rangarajan also writes about the brief history of the indian economy that is from the start of the 20th century to the present date so as a part of this editorial discussion let us see all important points mentioned in the article and this editorial also has various basic terms relating to economics so while discussing the article let us also see about these economic terms so before getting into our discussion i have displayed the syllabus relevant to this news article discussion you can just go through it So let us first look at the brief history of the Indian economy that is mentioned in the editorial. First is the pre-independence period. In the first half of the 20th century, that is between 1900 to 1950, India was under colonial rule. We know that the colonial government operated in India to serve the British Empire and all the Indian people. So as we expect India's growth in the first half of the 20th century when it was under the British government was dismal. The British government on one hand decimated the Indian handicraft industries and on the other hand they did not allow the development of Indian native modern industries. Okay? And although post the partition of Bengal and Swadeshi movement Indian industries witnessed some growth This growth negated British tax policies which favored on the foreign businesses. Can you remember what the colonial government did to Vivo Chidambaranar and his Swadeshi steam navigation company? So in essence the British did not allow the native industries to grow. In addition to this there were two world wars during this period. There were many man-made famines in India and in the 1930s the world witnessed the great depression. All these affected the Indian economy's growth rate in the first half of the 20th century. And due to this, India's annual growth rate during the period was just 0.89%. Here when we are talking about the growth rate of the Indian economy, we are actually talking about the growth rate of India's GDP. and gdp or the gross domestic product is the money value of all the goods and services produced within the geographical boundaries of a country so between 1900 to 1947's average annual gdp growth rate for india it was 0.89 percentage okay and now moving on in the same period india's population grew by 0.83 percentage and per capita income grew by a decimal 0.06 percentage this was the condition of the indian economy in the first half of the 20th century okay so now next we'll look at the india's growth story from independence to the start of the lpg reforms that is from 1947 to 1991 India got independence in 1947 and this was 2 years after the end of the World War 2. See the Indian economy at that time was in shambles. We already saw that between 1900 to 1947 India's annual growth rate was a very low that is 0.89 percentage. So immediately after independence our national leaders focused on steps that would accelerate India's growth. At that point of time India had two choices either to choose the western capitalist form of development or the USSR socialist form of development India chose the socialist form of development 
India based this decision on two things. One is that while the entire Western Hemisphere was suffering from economic despair due to the Great Depression of the 1930s, the Russian economy was performing very well. And the next thing that motivated India's decision was its colonial past. India grew to distrust foreign capitalists. So due to these two reasons, India chose to follow the socialistic planned economy model of the USSR. Okay. And in this period, India focused on the following. First is taking steps to increase the savings rate and investment rate. Here the savings rate measures the amount of income that households, businesses and governments save. Savings rate is often expressed as a percentage of GDP. See, savings rate is an important measure of an economy's health. When do we save money? When we have excess income, we save money. Am I right? So, when the savings rate is high, it means the people of the economy are making more money than they spend. This savings rate is directly linked to the investment rate. Why? Because we keep our savings in the bank. The banks in turn give our deposit as loans to businesses. So, our savings turn into investments. So, for this investment rate to be high, the savings rate has to be high. Okay? An investment rate is often expressed as gross fixed capital rate, which is nothing but the fresh investments made in the country, the form of plant and machinery, and other fixed capital as a percentage of the country's GDP. Okay, all these are what making as gross fixed capital rate. Okay, so in the initial stage, our national leaders focused on increasing the savings rate and the gross capital formation rate. Okay, then India made sure there is a dominance of the public sector in all aspects of the country. They also took some steps to protect the small and the cottage industries and this was done through the Industrial Policy Resolution of 1956. An additional information here, this industrial policy resolution of 1956 is called Economic Constitution of India. And finally, in the case of the external sector, India focused on import substitution and domestic manufacturing of capital goods. See, India mainly focused on the heavy industries. And this was expressed clearly in India's second five-year plan, which was called the Nehru Mahalanobis model. See, between independence and the 1970s, India's growth has been modest. The average growth rate during this period was around 3.6 percentage. And in the same period, India's population was growing at 2.2 percentage. And India's per capita income grew at a meager 1.4 percentage. Although these numbers show that India did not achieve the growth it has planned, but achievement made by India in this period was deniable. See, India's industrial production base expanded mainly among the core heavy industries. Also in this period, India started the process of green revolution which augmented its food grain production. In the social sphere, India made significant achievements in literacy and life expectancy in this period. These are some of the aspects of the Indian economy during the first two decades of India's independence. See, although India achieved moderate success, I am saying in growth wise, the weakness in India's socialist model of growth started appearing in this period. See, the majority of India's public sector undertakings were not making enough profits and some were even loss making. This was because these public sector undertakings were not run like businesses, but it was run like public service. In addition to this, due to the near non-existence of the private sector during this period, there was lack of competition and this made the public sector undertakings inefficient. Here I want to quote an interaction between J.R.D. Tata and Nehru. See, when J.R.D. Tata told Nehru that the public sector undertakings need to make profit for them to be self-sufficient, Nehru replied, never talk to me about the word profit. It is a dirty word. This quote of Nehru summarizes the Indian economy in the period from 1947 to 1970.
See, by 1970, the critics of Nehruvian socialism grew. They wanted the Indian economy to open up and follow the Western capitalist model. But the top brass in the Indian government resisted change and they stuck with Nehruvian socialism. Interestingly, China also faced the same crisis that India faced in the 1970s. But the Chinese government adopted globalization instead of resisting. This is why China is performing better than India now. Don't believe me? Look at this graph. Up to the 1970s, India and China had comparable GDP. But after that, China started overtaking India in a great way. All because of the fact that China adopted globalization earlier than India. Okay. And from the 1970s, Indian economy's health started deteriorating further. The public sector undertaking's condition worsened. India's economy sustained due to the support provided by our long-term partner, USSR. Then in the late 1980s, India's fiscal deficit and current account deficit worsened. In 1991, India faced its worst balance of payment crisis, like the one that Sri Lanka faced recently. See, India just had $1.2 billion in its forex reserves. Compare this to the present condition when India is having $550 billion in the forex reserves. And at the same time, no, USSR was disintegrating and it was not able to help out India. So in 1991, India was forced to take help from the International Monetary Fund, that is IMF. This help came with a condition. The condition was the LPG reforms. So basically, India was forced to open up its economy and to adopt reforms. That is, India was to adopt liberalization, privatization and globalization reforms. That is the LPG reforms. These are the major events of the Indian economy from independence to the LPG reforms of 1991. Okay. Now comes the last phase, that is in 1991 to the present. See, as a part of the LPG reforms, India adopted three things. First, in removing the complex regime of licenses and permits and dismantling the infamous license charge. Second, the role of the state was restricted and private sector's role increased. And thirdly, the Indian economy was opened up to foreign trade. From the concept of import substitution to preserve forex reserves, post liberalization, India adopted the concept of export promotion to increase its forex reserves. Okay? And the reforms adopted by India started yielding results almost immediately. Between 1992 to 93 and 2001, India's GDP increased annually by 6.20%. And between 2001 to 2 and 12 to 13, it grew by 7.4 percentage. And the growth rate between 13 to 14 and 19 to 20 was 6.7 percentage. In the 2007 to 8, India achieved its peak investment rate of about 39.1 percent. Despite various global crises like the 2008 US subprime lending crisis, 2019 COVID-19 crisis and the very recent Russia-Ukraine crisis, India has sustained its growth rate. Due to the efforts taken by various governments, India managed to become the fifth largest economy in the world as of 2020. So this is the condition of the Indian economy currently. So till now, we have seen the brief history of the Indian economy since the start of the 20th century. Moving forward, let us see the steps that India must take to become a developed country by 2047. See, although India is the fifth largest economy today, India's per capita income tells a different story. In 2020, India's per capita income was around 2,277 US dollar and India's rank was 142 out of the 197 countries. To get the developed country tag, India must achieve a per capita income of 13,000 dollar and to achieve this, they must ensure this following things. First is, India must ensure a sustained economic growth of 7% per annum for the next two decades. 
and secondly india needs to raise the gross fixed capital formation rate that is the investment rate from the current level of 28 percentage of gdp to 33 percentage of gdp okay and india must make sure that the public and private contribute significantly to investment thirdly india must maintain its incremental capital output ratio that is the i core at 4 Here, I-Core describes how efficiently investments are used in the economy. It is the ratio of the total annual investment made in the economy to the annual GDP growth in the economy. And fourthly, you no, know, India must ensure the presence of a good investment climate. So the rate of investment can be sustained for a long run. Then inflation has to be controlled. This is to ensure that people's wealth is not eroded. Controlling inflation also indirectly leads to an increase in savings rate. Okay. Then India must take steps to observe the new and emerging technologies so as to increase efficiency. Then India must promote its exports and take steps to become an integral part of the global supply chain. Finally, while focusing on economic growth, India must also take steps to provide social security to its citizens. This will help in bringing equity. This is because growth without equity is not sustainable. And if India takes these steps, India can achieve sustained economic growth and sustained growth in per capita income. This will help India become a developed country by the time it reaches its 100th anniversary of independence. Okay? So that's all regarding this news article discussion. See in this news article discussion we had holistically covered the history of Indian economy as well as we had seen the steps suggested by Mr C Rangarajan for India to achieve a developed country status within its 100th independence anniversary okay so a wide topic is covered under this discussion pay attention and each and every point set in this is going to help you to improvise your main answer okay and with these key points in mind now let's move on to the next news article discussion now have a look at this image see this image is indicating the kutub minar that is illuminated in blue color to mark world children's day see it stands tall and turn blue in support of reimagining a better and brighter world for children okay so in this context let us learn about this kutub minar See the Qutub Minar was begun in around 1202 by Qutbuddin Aybak and he was the first Muslim ruler of Delhi but could only finish the basement of the Qutub Minar then his successor Iltutmush added three more stories and then in 1368 Firoz Shah Tughlaq constructed the fifth and the last story and it was repaired by the rulers of the day Muhammad bin Tughlaq and Firoz Shah Tughlaq Then in 1503 Sikandar Lodi carried out some restoration and enlargement of the upper stories. See when we talk about its structures the development of architectural styles from Aybak to Tughlaq is quite evident in the minar. See the relief work and even the materials used for the construction differ. The 238 feet Qutub Minar is 47 feet at the base and tapers to 9 feet at the apex. See the tower is ornamented by bands of inscriptions and by four projecting balconies and this is supported by elaborately decorated brackets thus the tower has five distinct stories each marked by a projecting balcony and tapers from a 15 meter diameter at the base to just 2.5 meter at the top see the first three stories no are made of red stone and the fourth and the fifth stories are of marble and sandstone see this is a very important fact because in your prelims whenever this kind of questions are asked always they focus on the materials used or the architectural design used okay so note this fact and at the foot of the tower is the quwwat ul islam mosque see even though in ruins the quwwat ul islam or the light of islam mosque the qutub complex is one of the most magnificent structures in the world 
Kudupudun Aibak started its construction in 1193 and the mask was completed in 1197. Okay, and as said earlier, Tutmush in the year 1230 and Alauddin Kilji in the year 1315 made additions to the building. See, the main mask comprises of an inner and outer courtyard decorated with shafts and surrounded by pillar. See, close to the mask is one of Delhi's most curious antics, the Iron Pillar. See, this Qatul Islam is the first mask to be built in India and a 7 meter high iron pillar stands in the courtyard of the mask. It was brought from elsewhere in India and it bears a Sanskrit inscription from the 4th century AD. It describes the exploits of a ruler named Chandra. See, it is believed to be the Gupta king Chandragupta II. And the origin of Qutub Minar are shrouded in controversy. See, some believe it was erected as a tower of victory to signify the beginning of the Muslim rule in India. While others say it served as a minaret to the Muslims to call the faithful to the prayer. And before ending the discussion, let us see about this Qutub Minar complex also. See, what does this Qutub Minar complex mean? See, the Qutub Minar is surrounded by several great historical monuments and all of them together are what called as Qutub Minar complex. The complex includes Iron Pillar of Delhi, Qatul Islam Mask, then Alai Darwasa, then the tomb of Iltutmush, Alai Minar, then the Alauddin's Madrasa and the tomb of Imam Zaman and Major Smith's cupola. So, this is what we call as Qutub Minar complex. So, through this discussion, we saw about Qutub Minar, then we saw about the Qatul Islam mask, then also we covered the Qutub Minar complex. So, with this basic facts, no, you can attend any type of preliminary question. And note that the facts that we covered in this is very much useful for your prelims. Especially when we talk about the architectural design and who built it and how many stories are there and what are the stones or materials used. Those kind of facts are very much useful. Okay. So that's all about this image. With these key points in mind, now let's move on to the next news article discussion. Have a look at this news article. The former foreign secretary of India in a press note said that in the last eight years, the volume of India's soft loans to the neighboring countries has increased from about 3 billion to almost 15 billion dollars. So this is the crux of the news article given here. And in this context, let's learn about what are these soft loans and why are they provided. See, firstly, let's see about soft loans. See, a soft loan is a type of loan that is offered with no interest or the interest rates of the loan would be below the market rate. Okay. And it is also known by the term soft financing or concessional funding. Okay. See, the soft loans also have lenient terms such as there would be extended grace periods to repay the loans and they are typically offered for a longer period of time than conventional bank loans. Okay. And see, in some cases, no, soft loans are offered for a period of up to 50 years. Know that soft loans are often made by multinational development banks like World Bank, Asian Development Bank, International Finance Corporations, etc. etc. And soft loans are also given by federal governments or government agencies to developing countries. And sometimes the loans are also provided to neighboring and friendly nations by the governments. So this is all you have to know about the soft loans. Now let us understand why the soft loans are offered or why these concessional funding are offered to the neighboring countries. Okay. See mostly soft loans are offered to help the developing nations who are unable to borrow at the higher market rate. And this will help the developing nations to fund their infrastructure and development projects. Then the soft loans are also offered by government to business entities which may not get money from other sources. So it helps to expand the business further. Then the soft loans are often offered not only as a way to support nations but also to form economic and political ties with them. For example, China is helping African countries through their soft loans and in turn it helps both the countries to establish relationship with each other. Okay? 
then the soft loans are also offered if the borrowing nations has a resource or material that is of interest to the lender here the lender nation may get favorable access to that resource okay so these are the reasons why a nation provides soft loans to another nation okay so that's all regarding the soft loan topic and this is a very important economic topic because this is a news so you might be asked about this topic in your prelims so just know what is it about and why it is provided that is more than enough okay and with these key points in mind now let's move on to the next news article discussion now have a look at this news article see according to this news article drdo's director general said drdl's mission should be to create cutting edge technology and start exporting electronic warfare systems here drdl is nothing but the defense research and development laboratory whose headquarters is located in hyderabad see this drdl is india's missile development laboratory and it is a part of drdo which is the defense research development organization and this is about the news article given here and in this context let us see what is this electronic warfare see electronic warfare uses various parts of the electromagnetic spectrum to carry out military and intelligence missions the application of electronic warfare system can be classified into three types they are threat detection threat suppression and threat neutralization see in the case of threat detection the host country makes use of electronic spectrum to identify the enemy and it can also be used to identify enemy signals here radars are used to detect the location of the enemy this is one of the major applications of the electronic warfare then in the case of threat suppression the host country uses the electronic spectrum to jam the enemy signals it is also used to prevent and mitigate the damage caused by the enemy signals finally in case of threat neutralization the host country uses the electronic spectrum to neutralize the enemy threat here the enemy's electronic warfare system is decimated using the host country's electronic warfare system by now i guess you got the basic understanding about the electronic warfare and its application now let us see the electronic warfare system that are used in india see the latest electronic warfare system that was in use was the shakti electronic warfare system Shakti is an advanced electronic warfare system developed for the Indian Navy. It was developed by the Defence Electronics Research Laboratory in Hyderabad and it aims to provide an electronic layer of defence against the modern radars and anti-ship missiles. This is to various ships of the Indian Navy. And currently the Shakti system is installed in INS Vikrant and INS Vishakhapatnam okay another important electronic warfare system used by the navy is Sangraha Sangraha is a joint program of the DRDO and Indian Navy the next major electronic warfare system is the Samyukta which is being employed by the Indian Army it was developed jointly by DRDO Bharat Electronic Limited Electronics Corporation of India Limited and Corps of Signals of the Indian Army The system is fully mobile and is meant for the tactical battlefield use. Finally, the Divya Drishti is another electronic warfare system developed by the DRDO and Signal Intelligence Directorate. The system provides real-time situational awareness about adversary flying activities. That is it provides real-time awareness about the enemy aircrafts. So these are some of the electronic warfare systems employed in India. So through this news article discussion you would have known about what is this electronic warfare system why it is used and in India what are the electronic warfare system available so this is more than enough for addressing your preliminary type of questions okay so with these key points in mind now let's move on to the next part of the news article discussion which is the preliminary practice question discussion see today we have five questions in which three I'll be discussing and two will be a quiz question for you See regarding the quiz question if you had keenly observed to the discussion it is only based upon that so it will be very much easy for you to attempt okay now let's start with the first question it is regarding the soft loans now look at the first statement see it says it is a loan with no interest or the interest rate would be below the market rate see this is the clear definition of the soft loan so this statement is correct now before going to the next statement just have a look at the question it is demanding for incorrect statements so just now you found that statement one is correct 
So you can eliminate three options here whichever is consisting the first statement. That is A, C, D can be eliminated and easily you can arrive at the answer which is option B, 2 and 3 only are incorrect. But before concluding let us see whether these statements are incorrect and why it is incorrect. Now look at the second statement. It says it is provided only by the governments to other developing nations. See this statement is incorrect because other multinational development banks like World Bank, Asian Development Banks, they can also provide this kind of soft loans. In addition to that, other governments also can be providing these soft loans. Okay. So that is why this statement is incorrect. Now coming to the third statement, the volume of India's soft loan to neighboring countries has increased almost to 100 billion dollars. See this statement is incorrect because the volume of India's soft loan to the neighboring countries has increased from about 3 billion to almost 15 billion US dollars and not to 100 billion. Okay. And this is what we saw in the news also today. So this statement is incorrect. Now what is the answer for this question? Option B 2 and 3 only. Okay. Now moving on to the second question, see with reference to the battle of Purandar, these statements are given and you are asked to find the correct statement. Okay. Now let us start with the first statement. It was fought between the Mughal Empire and the Maratha Empire in 1665. See this statement is correct. Yes, the battle was fought between the Mughal Empire and the Maratha Empire in the year 1665 and the Mughal Emperor Aurangzeb appointed Jai Singh to lead a 14,000 strong army against Shivaji. Okay, now coming to the second statement. In this battle, the Maratha army led by Shivaji was turned to be victorious. See, this statement is incorrect because the Mughal forces killed the Maratha general and Shivaji surrendered on 2nd June 1665. So Mughal Empire won the battle and not the Maratha. Okay. See here also you found statement 2 is incorrect. But the question is demanding for correct statement. So you can eliminate options whichever is containing statement 2. That is A, B and D can be eliminated and the answer can be found which is option C 1 and 3 only. Before concluding, always verify whether the other statement is also correct or not. See, Treaty of Purandar was the outcome of the battle. This is what the third statement is saying. Yes, it is correct. In June 1665, the Treaty of Purandar was signed between Shivaji and Raja Jai Singh, who represented Aurangzeb. Okay. And as per this treaty, you know, many forts were relinquished to the Mughals and it was agreed that Shivaji would meet Aurangzeb at Agra. Okay. Now, moving on to the third question. See, among the following newspapers, which was founded by Netaji Subhash Chandra Bose. That is the question here. Here, the answer is option D, Swaraj. Okay. Then, when you ask me about the rest of options, Swarajya was launched by journalist Kasa Subharao under the patronage C. Rajagopalachari. Okay. Then, Voice of India, Dada Bhai Navarajji and Kesari is Lokmanya Bal Gangadhar Tilak. Done. And here this Swaraj was written by Netaji Subhash Chandra Bose. Okay. And displayed here are two quiz questions for you. Go through the question and try commenting the answers for these questions. And the correct answer will also be found in the comment section itself. Okay. And now displayed here are the main practice questions for you. See, go through the questions and keenly observe the discussion and try writing answer for these questions. It will be really helpful for your mains preparation. Okay. And that's all for today's discussion. If you like this video, do like, share and comment. And don't forget to subscribe to the Shankar AS Academy's YouTube channel. Thank you for listening.